anyone who's had the experience of, for instance, having a very difficult upbringing, if they've ever moved out of that, it's because they've learnt to draw on their internal resources. They've learnt to trust their intuition. They've learnt to change the pattern of their belief. Because this, this is how we do change beliefs. Beliefs are like very, are very powerful things. They're like kind of software that we don't notice we have anymore. And we become more and more convinced that, you know, they're real. But they're not. They're, they're arbitrary and they can be changed. And they're, they're, the way to change them is to get in touch with the deeper place of power which is inside ourselves. So if, if one wants to do this, in fact, all you have to do really is a very simple form of meditation. Some sort of simple meditation where you cease thought for a little bit, you cease the patterns of thought that are familiar and you just become a little bit still and then you'll, you'll, if you practice that enough, you'll notice that you get new, th new ideas, new insights, new sort of feelings bobbing up and that's the beginning of newness, of reconnecting with a more fluid um, sense of self. I think the reason people sometimes want to stay within a smaller sphere of activity is because those things become sacred to them. Their children, their home, they want the job to stay there because they want that money because they, it's the only th their home and their family is really the only place where something seems meaningful. And they're, they're worried that you know, the, the kind of corrupt, corruptive influences of the wider world can come in and damage that. Uh, they feel vulnerable. If we learn to open that up more, open that, that kind of um, flow up more in ourselves, we find that we're not vulnerable at all because we sh we were going to, we're going to shape the world according to that flow. We're not, we're not vulnerable to it anymore. And that's why in the myth, in the story in the myth, this wound, this wound that the, the wounded king has that's causing this wasteland, you can't solve that wasteland with activism and with policies alone. You, you can't go out there and try and change it all around and make it better. The, the only way you change the wasteland is you, you change the, you heal the king. You, you get rid of that wound. You get rid of that sense of disconnect and powerlessness. And when you do that, that world will change. That's our power. We have that power to do that. And that's what the Grail myth is telling us. The point is that that interior dimension of ourselves, which everyone has, y you can trust the basic motivation of it because it is, it is not out to kill everyone else. It is beneficent. It's benign. It's love, actually. And it's something that we've all experienced quite often. Um, and what that also means is that the ideas that are going to be formed in this, what I've called the more coherent whole technology of consciousness, when, we're, when there's that balanced awareness between inner and outer, and we're weighing things up, and we're t t turning things backwards and forwards in our mind, um, you can trust that the ideas that emerge within that balanced system will be benign. They, they will they will have that wholeness in them as seeds. And the other piece about this is that all that attempt to, to get stuff, to control people, to correct things out in the world, but, but particularly that, the, the, the desire to sort of just grab everything rather than to, to just, you know, get the bonuses, to 28 million bonus or whatever it is, Instead of creating a healthy, balanced economy that might work for everyone, um, all of that, none of that necessarily brings joy. You see, that's what's so peculiar about it. I mean, it's obviously it's lots of it's fun to have lots of money. It's fun to go and buy things. We all want to do that. But if it becomes a substitute for the joy of creativity, for the for the for the joy of simply being and, and witnessing the beauty, 
in people, in our surroundings, in the planet, if it becomes a substitute for that, then we've got a problem, you know, because we'll never get enough. You know, another myth that speaks about this is the myth of Narcissus. And Narcissus was quite a cold-hearted youth and lots of people really liked him, but he wasn't interested in anyone. And one day he sees his reflection in a pond and he falls in love with it. But of course he can never meet that person, he can never get to it because it's just a reflection in a pond and he, he fades away and dies. And narcissists really do seem to be rampant in particularly in um, you know, the business world, and they're out for themselves. They're just out for themselves. They're out for their own aggrandizement. And it's a form of, you know, we call it a personality disorder. Um, but those people aren't necessarily satisfied in the end. They, they never get to what they're really wanting. And what do they really want? They're seeing that reflection of themselves. What they really want is that deeper self that's back of them. They want that sense of wholeness, they want that sense of, of completion um, and coherence. That's what, that's what satisfies. 